So what I want to talk to you today specifically about are some very new things that are FDA approved um, in the brain for deep brain stimulation. So most of the time I talk to you about the non-FDA approved stuff. This is actually technology that is just in the last year, year and a half FDA approved and really exciting and has changed the, has cha definitely changed all of uh, deep brain stimulation, particularly in Parkinson's and for those folks with Epilepsy. So just to re-remind you, because a lot of you have heard, uh, deep brain stimulation is essentially a pacemaker for the brain. We implant a wire into a, targets, different targets for different disease states in the brain. We connect it to a pacemaker type device in the chest, and we provide high frequency stimulation that overrides whatever brain circuit we're attempting to affect. And the improved indications, um, essential tremor was the first approved indication, then idiopathic Parkinson's disease, but the new one, just in the last six months, is epilepsy, which is very exciting. And then there's a humanitarian device exemption for dystonia and obsessive compulsive disorder. I've talked to you about the things coming down the line last year and the year before and the year before that. Um, and so I'm not going to go there. But I want to talk to you specifically about the devices themselves, because a couple of things have changed. And in particular, we now have what's called directionality or directional leads and something called MICC, we love these alphabet soups, multiple independent current control. Um, so the components of deep brain stimulation, as we talked about, were the lead connected to a battery. The traditional lead um, has a ring. It's just a ring shape. And, and as you might, whoa, made that go away. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so it, it provides spherical stimulation. You have a ring, it provides electrical stimulation, and it works in a circle. As you increase the energy delivered to that ring, it increases the size of the field. And this is important. That makes placement exceedingly critical. Now, when I say placement, I'm talking about a half a millimeter, a millimeter and a half. There's one paper that says three millimeters. I think that's crazy. Um, but half a millimeter, a millimeter and a half deep in the brain makes a big difference, particularly when you have this circular or ring type configuration, what I'll now refer to as ring mode or omnidirectional. So the components of a directional lead, and there are two companies now on the market that have directional leads, um, is that you can actually now shape the field. So instead of having a circle that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you can turn on one of the, the leads. So there's typically two rings, and in the two middle contacts are split into thirds so that you can literally direct um, electricity to one-third, two-thirds, or you can put it into ring mode and create a sphere. This allows us to fine-tune stimulation in the brain to affect and specifically to avoid side effects. And this is most specific in Parkinson's because the structure that we typically stimulate in Parkinson's, and I'll show you in a minute, is the STN or the subthalamic nucleus. And it's surrounded, it's a very small structure, surrounded by a lot of other structures that can cause side effects. And so as people's Parkinson's progresses and you have to increase the stimulation, you end up getting side effects that can become intolerable. This directionality has allowed us the opportunity to have a lead that, that avoids that down the line. The other thing it's allowed us to do is, I'm going to tell you, honestly, there are folks out there who don't have fellowships and who are like, oh, it's just stereotaxis. I can just put something in the brain. I can put a lead anywhere. It's not that hard. So in those poorly placed leads, it gives you an opportunity to salvage the lead rather than the patient undergoing brain surgery. But very interestingly, we now talk about something called tissue volume of activation. So what volume of tissue in the brain are we activating to activate that circle? And so what, what this study showed was that if you use, it, it compared single segment to two segment and then three segment activation on, on the laterality and on, on the volume of tissue activation. And what it showed was that um, if you look at it, the segment laterality is the top blue line. And so as you go to lower and lower um, amplitudes, you get more directionality. So you get more directionality at lower amplitudes. You can't control what the, the impedance of the tissue, the electrical impedance of the tissue of the brain is. And, and literally a half a millimeter in one direction or, or a third of the way around that lead, you might have two totally different tissue impedances because the tissue has different, different 
qualities electrically. And so what we found is that the degree of directionality is the highest at these low amplitudes, which is exciting because we can deliver less energy to the brain. Um, and the directionality decreases at higher amplitudes, but it still remains strong. And so directional programming can be performed at lower amplitudes. That means a lot to us because one of the problems with deep brain stimulation is that these batteries or generators die. Um, and so it allows us to deliver lower energy um, and preserve battery life. And so when I talk about the, the structure, the STN, that gray structure that you see in front of us, is the structure that we're concerned about stimulating. And the, just lateral to it, and I can't seem to make the, is the, the capsula interna. So what that'll cause is a side effect of tugging, tightness, or pulling. People's faces or body will pull. Um, just below it is the um, medial lemniscus. You can get eye deviation. If you're too medial, you get eye deviation and speech slurring. Um, if you're too anterior, you get this uncomfortable. Like people just, they sweat and they turn red and they just don't feel well. And if it's too posterior, they get this tingling that they can't tolerate in their body. And so what happens is that you get tremor redu reduction in an area called the zona inserta. You get reduction of the rigidity the, the slowness or akinesia and the tremor in STN. But if you stimulate any of these others in orange, you can get dyskinesias, you can get inhibition of the dopamine that Parkinson's patients are taking, and then you can get that dysarthria and that tetanic contraction so you, and gaze deviation. And so you don't want to stimulate these areas. And this is literally six millimeters by four millimeters wide. These are small, small targets. So you might put a lead here and you might stimulate and you're getting reduction of your rigidity, your akinesia, your tremor, but you're also inhibiting the L-DOPA effect of the medication they're taking. So it's sort of equalizing itself and not that effective. Or you can move stimulation up the lead and be right in STN, but you're still, as you can see, tagging a little bit of that L-DOPA effect. But what if the lead's poorly placed? What if it's not actually in STN? Um, what if it's a little bit lateral by a millimeter or two? and you provide circular or ring-type stimulation, what you get is a whole bunch of side effects that people can't tolerate. Instead, with directionality, you can literally turn on those more medial contacts, turn off the lateral contacts, and you can take a lead that's not well-placed, and you can turn it into an effective, well-placed, or, or, or effective lead from a programming or a stimulation standpoint. So here's a study uh, that shows how, just how much deviation is there from planning? And these are stereotactically trained neurosurgeons. These were not just a bunch of folks who were like, oh, just try to plan and then we're gonna look. These are people who do deep brain stimulation all the time. So mechanical targeting, just meaning the, the targeting that you do by, by the mechanical, anywhere between 0.42 to 1.25 millimeters of deviation. Brain shift, so you poke a hole in somebody's dura, you let a little air in and you let a little CSF out and the brain shifts over, you can get up to 1.8 millimeters. With MR and CT rigid, it's the closest, you get about 0.7 millimeters of error. If, and then MRI distortion, we use MRI to plan almost all of it, and there's distortion inherent in MRI, you get 0.7. So when you combine that, you get anywhere from 1.2 to 3.2 millimeters of difference. Now, remember I told you the target's only about four millimeters wide. So that's a huge deviation, and these are with really well-trained folks. So directionality does matter. The point of this is that you can do everything perfect, and you can still be 3.2 millimeters away. So the PROGRESS study um, is a study that looked at directionality, and it was an international, multi-center, prospective, blinded observer, blinded subject. So they did a single-arm crossover, meaning that everybody who got um, directional stim also got unidirectional or omnidirectional stim. And essentially it was looking at is directionality superior or is directionality at least equivalent to the ring mode that we have traditionally had. And TW is a therapeutic window. Um, so we wanted to, sh they wanted to show that you actually got a better therapeutic window using directionality than with omnidirectional. So they enrolled, they implanted, and everybody for the first three months after the initial, initial programming got omnidirectional stimulation, and they looked at the therapeutic window, and then everybody got directional stimulation, which, and they looked at the therapeutic window, and then afterwards they let 
the physician aside, which they liked better, what they wanted. Up to 12 months, this was a 12 month study. So here's what's so interesting about it. Non-inferiority was at 40%. If 40% of folks got equivalent, that was what was determined statistically to be non-inferior, meaning that they were equal. Superiority was at 60%. So you only had to reach 60% to, to really show that you got superiority. 90.6% of the 202 subjects had um, a directional stimulation, and we showed not we, I was not an investigator on this trial, but we as in, in the medical community showed that directionality is not only equivalent, it's superior. So um, the results showed that 90.6% of subjects had a wider therapeutic window and a 39% reduction compared to otherwise in the TCS, which is the tremor control score, um, with directional at three months. So. Then you look at the, what are the active stimulations at 12 months? Remember, I said the first six months was either crossover, you either got omnidirectional or directional stimulation, but then the physician got to decide for the last six months. By the last six months, 86% of the subjects had directional settings. Their physicians, who were well-known, very skilled programmers, had decided that the best way to deliver energy and, and stimulation to get the best side effect profile and the best um, stimulation for these Parkinson's patients was with directional. So that's directionality. And both of these companies have directionality. And I'm not even going to name the companies. I don't really care who the companies are. What I want to talk to you about is the science. There is a special advancement within directionality that is really what I feel like is the game changer. Everybody was excited about directionality, but really the game changer is what's called multiple independent current control, voltage control versus voltage control. So I'm going to tell you. So voltage control is essentially you send, you send energy down a single pipeline. And then at the end, at a node, you split the energy to, well, they call them A, B, and C, those third split directional leads. You might say, I want 30% at A and 70% at B. And so the energy splits at a node versus multiple independent current control, meaning every single one of those split contacts con um, contacts has its own electrical energy. Um, and the reason that, that MICC is superior, as I'm going to show you, is that you can be accurate in the steering. I've got a, um, something to show you here. So what you have is a directional lead with a single source. You get the purple areas where you get benefit, the orange areas where we're going to get side effect, and this is a, a split or a directional lead. As you can see, there are three contacts there. If you have voltage control, meaning it goes down one pipeline and then you split it at a node, you send 100% down, you know 100% is going where you want it to go. You send 100% down, you know 100% is going where you want it to go. It doesn't have anywhere else to go, it's only going. What happens when you want to say 30% and 70%? Well, the physics of electricity is that the electricity will go to the area of lowest impedance or lowest resistance. Remember I told you that you can't control the resistance or the impedance of the tissue at the end of the lead. And so if you send it down a single pathway, you, actually, you might say 30% here and 70% here, but you actually don't know how much is get going where because you don't know what the electrical impedance at the end of the lead is, the, tissue, the impedance of the tissue. So if you have one contact that's sitting in an impedance that's higher, even though you might say send 70% there, guess what? All the electricity is going to go to the other one. And so you really can't control very well. You can shape it a little bit, but you can't control very well where you're sending that stimulation. But if you have multiple independent current sources, 100% down, 100% goes. Not any different. But if you say 25% here and 75% there, you know that you are getting 25% and 75% because you've sent them down separate pathways. They're not decide, the electricity is not deciding for itself based on physics where it's going to go at the end. 25% is literally going to one contact, and 75% is literally going to the other contact. And so you can very fine tune. You want to change it to 30 and 70, you change it to 30 and 70. You want to change it to 40 and 60, you change it to 40 and 60. And as you can see, you're actually shaping the field to get the most benefit 
right? Little less benefit here, little less benefit here. We want to capture all the benefit and still stay away from the side effects. We can do that in a far more accurate way with multiple independent current control than we can with that single voltage controlled system. So here's a, a nice, oh, the animation didn't work. I was gonna show you a nice little animation about, it didn't work, that's okay. Um, so the other thing that, that we have available to us is for the first time ever, we have eight contact leads in the brain. Typically there's a four contact lead in the brain. We have eight contact leads that from one of the companies in the brain. And that's interesting not for Parkinson's, but it's interesting, um, it's mostly used in essential tremor because the target is much larger. But the other interesting thing, and this has not been studied, this is not FDA approved, but when I go to my meetings and I sit down with a lot of the researchers and investigators, like Francisco Ponce down in, in Phoenix, et cetera, we talk about, well, there are certain folks who have both essential tremor and Parkinson's. And you have to pass through the essential tremor target in the thalamus to get to the STN target in Parkinson's. An eight contact lead actually spans that difference. And not only that, this eight contact lead will allow, four, with one generator, four different areas of specific control. So what we wonder is, what if you had somebody who has both, right? Instead of putting four leads in their brain, how about you put two? And how about you turn on stimulation in the essential tremor target to treat their essential tremor? And how about you turn on the stimulation in the STN and treat their Parkinson's symptoms and treat both the same way? So there are folks who are setting up trials to look at that, but that's super exciting. It gives us a lot of flexibility, far more flexibility than we, than we have ever had in the brain um, from this. So I have a case report here of, of like how, how do you program it, and some of these numbers won't make any sense to except about four people in this room who do programming. But it's a 56-year-old male with Parkinson's, um, and so he was implanted with bilateral, and it does have the, the device name because this is their study, so I have to leave it in there, Versace Cartesia, which is one of the directional lead symptoms. And at six months post-implant, we know that he went from a 62 off-med to an 18, which was better than his on-med UPDRS, or United Parkinson's Rating Scale of 24. So he's better on stimulation than he was on medication alone. That's not new exciting data. We've known that about DBS forever. That's why DBS is superior to medication alone in Parkinson's. But really, um, what, we, what this person had were some speech issues, and it might be here, I can do it here. Will it work? So, it didn't work. <laughs> it worked on my computer at home, but anyhow, the patient had some dysarthria and some speech issues. And so, so what they were able to do, if I had been able to show you the video, was they were able to use the directionality. Back one. Nope, it didn't work. Anyhow, they were able to use the directionality to program away that dysarthria or the speech issue. Oh, here we go. Wait. Where is it? There we go. Well, there was sound with it. Montag, Dienstag, Mittwoch, Donnerstag, Freitag, Sonntag. Sorry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. K, 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 K. It's not. It didn't play all the way. Anyhow, so what they were able to do, just to show you, I was hoping it was going to be all exciting, was program away the dysarthria by using directionality, something that they couldn't have done in the ring mode. And it compared ring mode to directional and the dysarthria that occurred, which was super exciting. Um, here's another case report. I'm going to just pass through it, but uh, just for the sake of time. But most. Anyhow, we're getting better reduction, we're getting better symptom control um, with directionality than we could before. Here's one that is interesting, and you don't need the sound to see it. So this patient was programmed, and he did great. He was off of all of his dopaminergic meds, as we said before, um, and he was walking fine, and I'm gonna show you the video. However, he had a problem with turning, and it was a pirouette test, and so he had this real problem with turning, and now I know how to make this work. You're going to watch him as he walks, um, and you're going to see that his walking is essentially totally fine, maybe. Oh, 
oh my gosh, I was so excited about all these videos. <laughs> all right, well, so he walks just fine. Um, but but I, I will do a dramatic reenactment. So he walks fine, right? I'm an actor, I can do that. He walks just fine, but then when he goes to turn, he can't turn, right? And when and you couldn't tell which side it was from. You couldn't tell if it was the right side or the left side, what was really happening. So what you were able to do with directional sim was you were able to actually identify that it was his left leg that actually wasn't turning. The right leg was doing fine. So if you had him walk, you knew that you had him programmed well, he's off of all of his dopamine meds, he's doing great, but he can't turn. So what they were able to do is then do some asymmetric programming um, for, this, for the patient. No, it won't advance past that. Uh, they were able to do some asymmetric programming that allowed him to be programmed one way on one side, one way on the other side, and turn fine. And that's how they did. So they did 4 milliamps on one side and 1.6 on the other. And they were able to get his turning to come back. And I'm not going to show you the video because obviously it's not working. Maybe I have to. There we go. So if you don't believe me because I gave you one study, there are... There's a ton of data out there, so I'm just going to show you that the, the data shows in a case study, this is a case study, right, but how directional steering works. And what we can see is that with the worst orientation of the lead, that's where directional really makes a difference. So if the lead is not oriented very well, directionality makes the biggest difference, but it, also, but it does make a big difference when it's a very effective place lead. And so there's also a global registry, which is really interesting with the directional leads out of Germany. And so what they're doing is looking at the real world outcomes, not just what happens in the study, but once these folks have been implanted, because of course they are implanted in Europe way before they're in implanted in the US, um, do we really get long-term effect with directionality? And so what we see is that the green shows that there's an impact, the blue is a no change, and the red is a worsening. So as we can see, directionality just has marked impact, 95, 97, 94% impact based on subject, clinician, and caregiver responses. So all three of the folks who are involved in directional um, with Parkinson's show that it makes a difference, and that's ongoing. So there's also a DBS clinical study with best directional versus best ring mode. I mostly put this up here to show you that like, it's not just one study. They, the FDA approved it on, based upon the progress style, uh, trial, but it's not just one study. So there's the Intrepid trial came out of the University of Minnesota with Jerry Vitek and Phil Starr out of UCSF to evaluate safety. Well, of course, it was safe. Um, the results showed that a cohort of 160 randomized studies at 12 weeks at one year follow-up had a 49.2% improvement. So that's great. Um, and it met its prior, primary end goal, and um, this was an increase in total on time as well, so that makes a big difference. On time is when they feel best with their medication, and that was a 6 plus 3.8 hour increase. So anywhere between a 6 to a almost 10 hour increase in their on time a day, that's huge. Um, and so the results show that at 52 weeks, most people were randomized to at least two to three, and it started to increase. So people started moving towards that directionality as time moved on. So I'm going to fly past this because I want to get to, what I really want to get to um, is now DBS for epilepsy. So the new indication, epilepsy. So this is also a game changer. It's been approved in Canada for about five years, but it was just approved, and I will tell you, I will use the company name for this one, Medtronic is the only company that has epilepsy approval at this point. So um, it's anterior thalamus DBS. So Bob Fisher was the one who really talked about it, and if you look at this, this map here, you can see the circle of papes, or papes as they call it in Canada, um, uh, and you can see that you can stimulate on multiple nodes of this circuit, so it goes from anterior nucleus of the thalamus to cingulate gyrus to fornix to cingulum, and then down to the hippocampus, and so if you stimulate on one of these nodes, and the one that they landed on was anterior nucleus of the thalamus, what you get is seizure frequency. So the indications, what kind of seizure patients, what kind of epilepsy patients is anterior nucleus, or ANT, DBS, Good for. It reduces the frequency of seizures. It was only studied in patients 18 or older. There's a pediatric study running in Europe right now. Um, partial onset seizures. So those are seizures that originate from one cerebral hemisphere, not the ones that are global, um, with or without secondary generalization. So 
what that means is it, it can stay on one side, but it's good for folks who have it where, it's st where the seizure stays on one side. And it's also good for folks that generalize all the way across and the whole brain has seizure activity. And it's only good for folks who are refractory to three or more ep epileptic medications. What we know is if you give more than three epileptic medications, the seizure reduction is almost nil, and the side effect profiles are high. So this is really studied in people who've tried multiple medications. We don't jump to surgery first here. And they have to have six or, or more seizures a month over the three most recent. So the, the big trial for this one is the Sante trial. It was 110 patients. They had at least six partial seizures, some of them including that secondary generalized in the previous three months. There was a blinded phase. 55 patients were on stim, 55 patients were off stim, and the primary endpoint was seizure reduction after three months. And then they moved into an unblinded stage where all patients got stim. So as you can see, they were implanted. Interestingly enough, their seizure frequency dropped after implant for whatever reason, we don't know why, um, or, or, or actually before they were op operated. And then, then post-implant, the control subjects are the top line, that dotted line, and you can see that their seizures were higher. They had a higher seizure frequency. They did have a reduction from baseline just from surgery, but they had a higher seizure frequency than the folks who were in active stimulation by a marked amount, and this was blinded. This is not a stimulation where they can tell whether the stimulation is on or off. You don't have any symptom side effects. You don't have anything you can test or record. It's just on, and they don't know whether it's on or off, which is nice because then they're not focusing on it. Um, but as you can see, uh, no, they got returned to their, their primary medications. And so the mean percent difference in seizure frequency with or without was really important. This is really important. We saw just in that first blinded phase that there was a reduction with, with an outlier excluded of about 10% and um, in the intent to treat group about, of about 11%. So the results of the Sante trial were that it, DBS significantly reduces frequency of seizures in adults. They must have medically refractory partial onset epilepsy. It reduces the most severe seizures, and I'm gonna show you the seizure severity score in a minute, of their complex partial, and it also reduces, because they're not having as many seizures, injury related to their epilepsy. Um, and then long-term, patients who've had VNS, it also works in patients who have had VNS, and it, guess what, it also works in patients who've been resected and who are seizing through their resection or their VNS, and ultimately improves their quality of life. So uh, then they did a, a prospective single arm. So everybody's getting stim, multi-center, open label for Sante. And it was the unblinded phase, and they conducted it every six months, and they reported outcomes out to five years. And here's the exciting part about it, which is what I'm going to show you. It, gets, it just gets better and better. They only restricted programming changes in the first 13 months. So there was a seizure reduction for those subjects who actually did their diary for three months before each annual visit. And as you see, it gets better and better. So at 41% at one year, 69% seizure reduction at five years. This is life altering, life changing for these patients. The difference between a 69% reduction and even a 41% reduction might be the difference of getting out of your house, getting a job, having a life, having a social life. Not really driving because they're still having seizures, but at least getting out and, and being productive. So there was a median seizure reduction, and it was better at five years. It was significant in all of them for all the subgroups. So if they had temporal lobe seizures, if they had frontal lobe seizures, if they had other cortical seizure foci, if they'd had prior VNS, no prior VNS, prior surgery, essentially it works almost in anybody who, who fits the criteria, regardless of the source of their seizure um, and regardless of any other previous therape therapeutic treatments. And then... This is seizure severity. So not only are they having fewer seizures, when they're having seizures, their seizures are less severe, and it gets better and better and better over the course of five years. So this is, this is huge for these folks. So really, at the end of the day, the conclusion is that it significantly reduced seizure frequency, and it reduced seizure severity, and it got better as their stimulation went along. So it improved the one through five years, and so it really is 
an option for these patients who are refractory to multiple medications, who continue to seize through, whose lives are affected. I think it'll be interesting, and they didn't use this, they didn't do incidence of SUDEP or sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. Um, they didn't look at that, whereas NeuroPACE has looked at that. But I'm going to make a wild guess that if you're reducing seizure frequency and seizure severity, that you're probably also reducing the incidence of death or SUDEP um, in these patients.